It gives me great hope for France and it gives me great hope for Europe. He's a strong pro-European, but he also recognises that Europe has to be reinvented. It's one thing having a great vision. It also needs a much better popular offer. There is a picture of him and on the shelf behind him is a copy of your book, uh, The Third Man. Uh, do you see him as a, an heir to Blair? <laughs> In a sense, yes, uh, because... Uh, he's somebody who um, very convincingly has set out uh, to appeal both to the centre-left and to the centre-right to build a new coalition, a new majority in France who will give him backing uh, for the sort of reforms that he wants to see through but which you cannot see through in France without a, a, a big body of support behind you. But then what is the lesson uh, for the centre-left here is it that you really have to break with, as it were, the old left? I think you have to be prepared, as Macron did, uh, to uh, construct a campaign outside conventional norms or conventional outlook or attitudes. I mean, the public are absolutely outside the desperate. Party. I mean, outside in, the party. Well, in his case, yes, because the Party Socialist in France was collapsing, was crumbling around their ears. There really wasn't. Uh, a, a centre-left yeah. party with which to campaign anymore uh, worth its name. Like now, in the UK, now, you course, suggest? course, that isn't the case in uh, Britain, uh, where we still have a Labour Party. Um, uh, going through, obviously, the trials and tribulations that we've become familiar with. But I think the key point about uh, uh, Macron is that although he knew he had to appeal to both centre-left and centre-right, he knew he had to stand for something. He needed values. He has to have a clear sense of where he wanted to take the country. And do you see anyone who's a Macron-type figure here for the centre-left? Do you identify anybody? <laughs> uh, no, because the people you know, who are emerging are emerging within the Labour Party and not outside it, as Macron had to and do. Who are, he had no it, alternative. But, but who do you see emerging in the Labour Party I'm that has that centre-left mantle? I'm not going to tantalise you. Uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with names and guesses. All I know is that there are a younger generation in the Labour Party. Uh, they do have that sense of vigour and that mm. sense of commitment and one of them will come forward in order to lead the party to eventual victory. But it, it, that is, I'm afraid, some way off. So is there a circumstance, do you think, when voting Labour will not necessarily deliver the best result for the kind of Brexit that you would like to see, if well, you want to see a Brexit at all? Look, I'm a supporter of, the, of Open Britain, the largest pro-European membership organisation in the country. What they want to do uh, is to campaign in the most effective way against a hard Brexit, against, that, against giving uh, Theresa May the blank cheque uh, that she's looking for in this election uh, to take Britain out of, out of Britain, out of Europe, in my view, on the worst terms imaginable. So you're, this cross-party grouping, as it were, is launching its campaign now to, to mm. give support for the most pro-Remain candidate standing. Do you but, accept that also, that might not be a Labour candidate? But also to oppose those uh, yeah. who are supporters but, of the hard Brexit. And yes, they will be different people from different parties. In, so in that sense, what you're saying is in some constituencies it actually might be better to park your vote with the Liberal Democrats than for Labour. It but just that, may be. But that's for people to decide. We're not telling people no. how to vote. If you want to know how uh, I would vote if I had a vote in this election. Members of the House of Lords don't. But if they did, I'd be v supporting and voting for the Labour candidate. The point, Kirsty, is this is not to tell people how to vote. It's, it's to advise them and help them to make the most in effective intervention in constituencies around the country that could make a difference to the sort of majority that Theresa May gets at the end of it, as but she's most likely to do. I mean, that's what democracy is all about. But what is the Labour position on Brexit now? Well, search me. Uh, I mean, I think you need to wait for the manifesto. I mean, the, the problem for the Labour Party in this election on Brexit is very clear, and that is that they are not, I'm afraid, differentiating them, their position and their policy sufficiently uh, from the government, or haven't done so uh, up until now, uh, which you, they needed to do if they were going to offer the voters a clear choice. But I hope that that will uh, you know, come out in the wash. I hope in the coming days and weeks uh, we will see a clearer 
uh, rather more robust approach from the Labour Party on this because you know, Labour Party supporters and voters and members right across the country are looking for leadership on Brexit uh, rather than an equivocal, uh, rather more fence-sitting position and approach we've had to date. If there is a defeat of the Labour Party and just say Jeremy Corbyn puts on a million votes still, should he stay? He may see that as a mandate to carry on. I what would you say I about that? I hope he doesn't stay. Uh, any leader uh, who has the control of the party that he does, who, who will run the campaign in the way that he chooses, uh, must also own the result that he gets. And he must take the con for, you know, see the conclusion uh, that defeat uh, uh, presents him with and fall on his sword. I hope he will do that. Well, that's interesting. I mean, any, any person with a, an ounce of loyalty or responsibility to the Labour Party uh, would do precisely that. Just coming back to Brexit and the, and the yeah. idea that the, the, the thing that you're desperately trying to stop is a hard Brexit. Do you think that Brexit itself is an inevitability? We are on, set on a course to leave the European Union. We've had the referendum, we know the result. What we don't know, Kirsty, and this is absolutely fundamentally important, is how we're going to leave the European Union, on what terms, uh, with what future trade deal between Britain and the European Union. Now, on that, here's the point, in my view. The government is deliberately narrowing its options. I don't believe there is a one-size-fits-all Brexit. There are different permutations, there are different types of Brexit, different terms on which we can both leave the European Union and secure the greatest continuity of our trade in and with the European Union. And my complaint and my criticism of the government is that they're narrowing their options, they're taking options off the table. We know why. But it's for purely political and purely ideological if, reasons because she's giving in to the wild men in her party. But That's what she's doing. But if you're and in, in the process, she's sacrificing our nation's interest. Finally, are you proud to be a saboteur, a proud saboteur of Brexit? <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't be more pleased with the Daily Mail calling me a saboteur and saying that I had to be crushed. The other day, uh, the Sun newspaper devoted a leader uh, to denouncing my treachery uh, and my lack of patriotism. I tell you, I am as patriotic as the next person, but one thing I am not is a nationalist. I love my country, that's why I am a patriot. I do not hate other countries as nationalists do. Proud saboteur, Peter Mandelson, thank you very much. Thank you.